Well, we got fair weather once again in Texas. I'm sure it's not going to last very long. So people are out enjoying it while they can. Here's the map in the southwest U.S. We've been tracking that Pacific front. It looks like it's still just kind of circulating back out there. Upper level low is somewhere around San Diego and Los Angeles. And you can see those low ceilings in that area. And the best I can tell about the Pacific Front, maybe just east of Tucson up to the Mogollon Rim there. And then the old eastern polar front, that's backed up against the mountains of northwest Mexico into eastern New Mexico, kind of like that right there. It looks like it is starting to kind of fall apart a little bit along the Front Range. And there's those cool upper 60s and lower 70s that easterly flow into Texas there, helping to produce some very mild weather. And we're going to see that front kind of return up north tomorrow. So we'll watch for that. And that'll probably bring some destabilization and some in increasing chances of severe weather. Probably starting out around the hill country and then expanding eastward later Saturday and Sunday. Southeast U.S. looking like this. Now we're dominated by that high pressure there in the Mississippi River Valley, and it's given us our northerly flow along the Gulf Coast. So we're clearing out that moisture a little bit, but it is going to start returning once again up the Rio Grande Valley of Texas tomorrow. And already we can see the dew points starting to come up a little bit in that area, upper 60s, and looks like a thunderstorm along that front right there near Laredo. And up north in the Carolinas, 50s, and if you go north into the Appalachians, 30s and 40s. Let's take a look at that. So here's how things look in the northeast U.S. You can see it's a combination of that huge ridge going all the way up to Hudson Bay and the low pressure area offshore that's creating a pressure gradient, helping to bring those northwesterly winds in through Quebec, Ontario. And let's see, coldest temperatures I'm seeing, well, definitely below freezing up there near... Moosonee, 28, I guess that's North Bay, somewhat like that. Anyway, yeah, 28, so it is it is very cold there in Canada. And old man winter just kind of hanging on. And now let's move up to the Pacific Northwest. Looks like that old low-pressure system up there in Canada is occluding. That's what's left of that occluded front. And the main bear clinic system is down in South Dakota right there. And you can see that downslope just to the south of there, bringing in those low 70s. Quite nice for this time of year. And then up to the north, some fresh Canadian air coming in. And we're probably going to see this low in British Columbia become even more prominent over the next day or two as this whole Bear Clinic system comes together and shifts south into Idaho and Wyoming. It's not going to be a good day to drive that interstate. Uh, in fact, if you look at some of the videos on YouTube. Interstate 80 there, they've really gotten hammered this year along that stretch. And then of course, a Europe. Well, there's the picture in a Europe right now. Overall, it looks uh, very, very quiet. The big high pressure area up there in Germany, driving a lot of cool flow across Italy and the Balkans. And it looks like just this reinforcing shot coming out of Ukraine and the Crimea there. So that's some cold air coming down. And the next big change, well, it appears that there's a little low there in the Bay of Biscay there, just off the coast of France. That'll probably be moving inland, bringing a little cool shot into France. And then I think we're looking at another Atlantic system coming in from the west there into Ireland over the weekend. But overall, it is uh, very quiet there in Europe for this time of year and mild. 75 there in northern France. All right, so checking out the dynamics this evening. Well, this is pretty much going to follow what we had on that surface front. The surface boundaries are kind of like that, being driven by this high pressure in the Mississippi River Valley. And then we got that occlusion out there in Canada with more cold air coming out of that region. And then we have a pretty well-defined upper level low across LA and San Diego. Some of you viewers in that area probably getting some showery weather. And out ahead of that looks like a little bit of a front in Arizona. So that's the uh, setup. So what does that mean in terms of jets? 
Well, I think I'm going to paint them in red here. I think we're going to have one jet associated with that Pacific system, kind of, kind of like that right there. And then we're going to have a very active northern stream running something like that. And you can see how it goes from that Bear Clinic system in Montana all the way to this Bear Clinic high in the Mississippi River Valley because that high is associated with temperature contrast, warm air advection on this side, and cold air advection on that side. So we're going to go to the upper level charts and expect to find that jet there, and maybe kind of a split flow like that. A lot of times you'll find the subtropical jet kind of paired up in that anticyclonic curvature there in the southern U.S. So let's check it out. So on Pivotal Weather, to get to that, what we do is we go over to the panel on the left, go to Dynamics, and I usually look at the 500 heights and vorticity right there. All right, so there's our charts, and this is kind of like the mid-level flow. And yeah, there's that northern stream, just like we said, and then that, that other stream to the south, there it is, and looks like maybe a little bit of support for it. Yeah, so pretty much like we said there. And the upper level low, pretty much right over San Diego. So moving that forward over the next couple of days, well, that cutoff low is going to start rejoining with the prevailing westerlies right there. It looks like this trough comes in from the Pacific Northwest late tonight, or actually this is tomorrow night, and that'll help this trough down here in New Mexico open up, and then they'll just kind of sink up like you see right there. One big lobe of vorticity moving across Texas during the day on Sunday, so it looks to be pretty stormy there early on Sunday in Texas, and then that should spread eastward during the evening. Then we should see severe weather chances go up quite a bit in Louisiana, eastern Arkansas, and Mississippi. And this is that time of year where we're likely to see tornado activity. So there might be some potential right in that area there. So we'll keep an eye on that. And yeah, possibly even up to Tennessee. So maybe I'll just kind of redefine that area kind of like that. That looks to be about the threat area over mostly on Sunday. And then we get some northerly flow coming in. So it's going to cool down once again in the high plains in central U.S., in fact, it should cool down quite a bit next week. That's some really highly amplified flow there. You can see that big trough running about like that. So do we get a change? No. Looks like uh, kind of a blocking pattern. I see evidence of a Rex block there on the west coast for late next week. Looks like those lows kind of get picked up by this approaching upper level wave on the 20th and then we pretty much start getting to the end of the run. So overall, yeah, it looks uh, stormy. That northwesterly flow in the upper level is helping to bring down cool air and then these active southern streams helping to bring the moisture into the southern plains. So we're by any means not transitioned into spring yet. Looks like uh, May, the month of May could be kind of turbulent as we start shifting gears here. It's very act, much acting like March right now. Okay, there's our three-day forecast looking to, at the NAM. Let's run that forward and see what we're looking at here. Well, we've already gone over the dynamics for tonight, so what we're going to watch for tomorrow is things coming together in West Texas. You can see that thermal ridge, the uh, red pattern, See how that those thickness lines do like that? That's a warm axis. We're getting warm air advection developing in that region. And with the warm air advection, we've also got moisture advection working its way into Del Rio, Big Spring, and Lubbock. And we get that first thunderstorm complex go up tomorrow morning. And we should see that start expanding into Wichita Falls and Fort Worth as the day goes on. And that's probably going to be a long a warm front which is lifting north. We talked about that earlier. So it's kind of hard to tell where that warm front is tomorrow afternoon. But it's probably going to be right in that area, maybe just south of Dallas. And that means that anywhere north of that front, there could be a little bit of localized backing. You could get a little, get a little augmentation of the low-level helicity. Yeah, it looks like that first wave moves off into Arkansas and Louisiana tomorrow night. And then I can 
see the Pacific Front making an advance into the Big Bend in Midland area Saturday night. And we move that forward to, let's, let's move this up to 7 a.m. Okay, so now we can pick out the warm fronts a little bit. See that right there? That appears to be our warm front from about Dallas to El Dorado to Birmingham. Maybe that's Montgomery there. And then the Pacific Front running about like that. So our meso low about right that. And you, and you can see the new convective system coming together there near Dallas. So another period of rainy weather coming up. And then up to the north, here comes that big truckload of Canadian air moving south. That's going to be the frontal system on that. So let's see, moving into midday, things will shift eastward towards the Shreveport area. So that little warm front area is going to be in an arc kind of like that. So the best chance of supercells looks like that's along the Arkansas-Louisiana border eastward, right in that area there. That's what I'm going to be watching for. The cold front itself like that, but the model going for more forcing, probably a little bit more capping in that area. And then things really get going towards 7 p.m. Best opportunities for severe weather around the Memphis area and maybe some development out ahead of that in Alabama. I think the warm front is probably lifted about like that up towards Huntsville. And then back behind it, here comes the Canadian system moving south. Going into Sunday night, we've got a bit of a squall line coming together. I think our warm front's lifting up like that, and I think a lot of the severe weather potential kind of lifts up from Memphis up towards Paducah and Lexington, maybe in this area here. I'm not too sure about this activity down here. You can see the flow is a little bit more veered. See the surface flow looks kind of like that. In fact, if I bring up the hodographs, well, it looks like in this case the veering is not that important because there's tremendous zero through one kilometer shear. You see all that? Go from 15 knots at the surface up to 50 knots at one kilometer. So you only need to be a little ways off that photograph to get some good SRH. And not, not surprisingly, the severe weather parameter there going for tornadoes. So yeah, it looks to me like some hazards with this stuff. Certainly, maybe all the way up into the Ohio River Valley. I, I think there's some parallels there with the 74 super outbreak. Looks to be a very similar weather map. Maybe this stuff not so strong. But at the surface, yeah, that's almost dead on. So we'll see what happens with that. Let's pull up a proximity sounding for Kentucky out ahead of that line. Yeah, look at that. That's probably more, that's probably stronger shear than I've ever seen. Zero through one kilometer shear looking like that. You can see that the one kilometer winds are 80 knots. Out of the south, that's just incredible. And we're sweeping out a pretty huge area of SRH. SRH values, that's got to be off the scale. Yeah, look at that. 700, 800 SRH. Of course, that can be detrimental to your storms. Too much shear means you're kind of wringing the neck of those towers and you can easily kill off the updraft that way. So you, you, you kind of have to have a little bit of the instability to, to support that. But if you do get storms going, there's not much that prevents you from getting rotation. So this certainly could be a very potent day. The instability, let's see here, capes, very, very modest. So that's the uh, saving grace there. And looks like even a little bit of capping there at 700 millibars. Let's check out that flow, 850, let's see. That's some crazy flow. Let's go up to the 850 chart and check that out. Yeah, there's the 850 millibar chart for 10 p.m. Sunday night, and that's just crazy. Yeah, that's that's 80 knots right there out of the south. So we get these ridiculous photographs. You can see the GFS solution here going for a more southward location. Looks like maybe the fronts are maybe something like that right there. 
It's got most of the activity in the Huntsville, Chattanooga area, almost entirely south of Nashville. So that's definitely a different solution there. Let's check out the 850 winds. Definitely some tremendous winds there, over 70 knots, but again, we're focused a little more southward with that GFS model. Let's look at the European model. European model has got things focused there in Kentucky and Tennessee. And there's what it's got for precipitation there. This looks a little bit more consistent. I like the, the look of this. It's kind of a blend of both the GFS and the NAM. SPC focusing things south. That's more in line with the GFS there. So we shall see. I'm not going to spend time trying to figure out which model is going to excel here, but what I'm going to show you is that I guess the takeaway is that there's kind of a broad range of possibilities here. We could be looking at storms anywhere from the Ohio River Valley all the way down into Alabama, Mississippi, and anywhere in between. All right, yeah, that's probably about all I got for tonight. I will go ahead and start editing and wrapping it up. Keep in mind that the supporter-only stream will be running this weekend. I think we may do our webcast on Sunday. Might take Saturday off. We'll just have to see. I do need to make it clear we're not going to do anything like a four-hour live stream or anything like that. There's uh, time considerations, plus we don't have the internet bandwidth for any sort of quality going out. Our bandwidth was pretty constrained to begin with. Those of you who followed us in 2018 know that. And plus, the internet backbones around here are saturated since everybody is quarantining. So not a good idea, but we will give you some more of these quality streams on Sunday and focus on mesoscale detail and things you need to know to forecast severe weather. So I think you'll find it very useful. I'll try to post an update on Patreon there, but if you want to get in on that, here's the link. I'm going to pop that up on the screen. That'll take you to Patreon where you can become a supporter. And then you'll get access to the, those uh, private streams over the weekend and follow this severe weather outbreak. And I want to thank our new patron, Dan Dowland. Thank you for supporting the webcast. We all appreciate that. And that'll help us keep pushing on through spring and into the summer. Take care, you all. Have a good Easter weekend. And we will see you at the very latest on Tuesday. Bye-bye.